Belong Now Foundation, and I'm joining you live from our headquarters in San Francisco, uh, a sadly very quiet version of the Interval Cafe and Bar. Um, and um, tonight we're actually going to be sharing with you uh, yet another experiment in our uh, various forms of creating new ways of doing online talks for all of you uh, during this time of pandemic when we all have to record these from our, our homes and places of work um, that we can. Um, so in for this week or month, we have actually pre-recorded the talk and I've edited it and we're gonna air it uh, with you. And Rick uh, Doblin, our speaker tonight is gonna see that edit for the first time along with you. And then join in at the end for a live question and answer as well as uh, two of our founders, Kevin Kelly and Stuart Brand. Um, this talk is one that I've been working for a long time to, to bring to this audience. And uh, fundamentally, humans have been using psychedelic substances for thousands of years, but it's really only recently that they're finding ways uh, to a much more um, kind of accepted version in our society, both for medicinal and in, in less formal circles, obviously, for recreational use. Um, but Pretty much all of that advocacy and research that you have been seeing um, has really come from very few points in the world. And one of those uh, is Rick Doblin, who spent the last uh, 40 years or, or more of his life, most of his life really on this problem. Um, and so tonight he's gonna share that with us. Welcome, Rick. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, since uh, it's the Long Now Foundation, I, I really wanted to start with a very long-term perspective. And so while we're talking about trying to integrate psychedelics into the mainstream, into Western culture, the last time that actually was the case was 396 AD, 1624 years ago. And that was when the Goths sacked Eleusis and wiped out the Eleusinian Mysteries which had been going for almost two millennia, starting in 1600 BC, around then to 396 AD. And the Eleusinian Mysteries were involving a potion that was drunk called Kikion, and they figured out that this was moldy rye and barley that they used, um, ergot, that can produce a psychedelic experience. And that's where LSD was actually derived. It's synthetic, but it came from ergot. So, I think it's just really important to think about the fact that um, we're engaged in a sense in something that's uh, 3,200 years, and it's been 1,624 years since the psychedelics have really been accepted in full in the mainstream in Western culture. So that can suggest that when psychedelics really emerged into the culture in the 60s, it was after a very long hiatus and it was a very difficult emergence and it resulted in a terrible backlash. And now 50 years later, um, we're emerging from that. So I think that's the, the big perspective that we need to keep. Now, while I talked about psychedelics being sort of used in culture, in our Western culture uh, over 3,000 years ago, my story, my long now begins 50 years ago. You know, as I was growing up, I was very much uh, reading. I was born in 53 and raised on stories of the Holocaust. And that just terrified me that people could be so cruel to other people. And then for me, the next step was uh, Vietnam. And that was my own country that was doing things. And I was searching for solutions in a crazy world that, that murder all over the place. So when I was 17 years old, I went to college, new college in Florida, in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, it was an experimental college, and it still is. It's the Honors College of the Florida right now. And they had all-night parties with psychedelics till sunrise with dance parties with hundreds of people. And I thought, wow, this is really great. So I felt that this was an oasis of sanity in a, in a crazy world. And lo and behold, I came across the uh, Whole Earth Catalog. And this was absolutely pivotal in my development because I read this whole earth catalog and in it was a little report about a book called Programming and Metaprogramming in the Human Biocomputer by John Lilly. Um, John Lilly, who invented the flotation tank and then did LSD in the flotation tank as an effort to try to really understand how the brain is working. And, and this was very inspiring to me. So I tried to... Um, do LSD in 
this um, sensory deprivation environments. We didn't have a flotation tank, but we did reduce sensory input, things like that. And that got to be very difficult. This was now, again, after 1970, the Controlled Substances Act, the 60s had crashed and burned, Nixon was elected, the psychedelic research was wiped out. And so I had a difficult time with my um, psychedelic experiences. And so I went to the um, guidance counselor. This was the, the spirit of the time, quest into the unknown. That's why I really felt that um, I wanted to do this exploration. And I went to the guidance counselor though, and said, I, I need trouble help with my tripping. And the guidance counselor said, there's a book I'd like you to read by Stan Groff, who's kind of the um, world expert on LSD research. He helped start uh, transpersonal psychology. The book was Realms of the Human Unconscious, uh, Observations from LSD Research. And in it, Stan said, psychedelics are to the study of the mind, what the microscope is to biology and the telescope is to astronomy. And I felt very inspired by this book. And this is where my life sort of crystallized where I realized that here he was talking about the realms of the human unconscious. He was talking about psychodynamic areas, but also about the sort of death rebirth process and then transpersonal states, which I felt also had these important political connections. But Stan was wrapping this in a scientific framework. It wasn't a dogmatic religious framework. It was scientific framework. It was using psychedelics in a scientific study of the mind and it had the, for me, the very crucial reality check of psychotherapy. Can you use these insights about the mind, about the unconscious, to actually help people deepen their participation in life? Because so I thought it's a crazy world, and this is a long-term strategy. I felt that um, lots of people were doing lots of other uh, shorter-term strategies, but I felt that this helping people have the sense of connection was the antidote to fundamentalism, to genocide, and that even though the psychedelic research had been suppressed, I felt like it was the most important thing that I could be working on. And I didn't know if it would succeed or not, but it didn't really matter. And so this was the critical point for me where I focused uh, my life on psychedelics. The first thing I did was I dropped out of college, um, tune in, turn on, drop out. And I felt that I needed to, to get grounded and build things. So I, I built this handball court. Um, then I ended up building this house with a lot of help actually still have this house all these years later. Um, this is a big stained glass window inside of it. And this led other people to come to ask me to build houses for them. So I basically had a decade of, of getting grounded, trying to be balanced so that I could go back to put psychedelics as the forefront. I, 10 years later, I went back to the same college and I took a month-long workshop in 1982 at Esalen with Stan and Christina Groff. And that's where I learned about MDMA. So the history of MDMA begins uh, in 1912 when it was first synthesized and patented, patented by Merck, but uh, they didn't do anything at all till 1927. And Merck did some preclinical studies in animals and found nothing of interest, and they decided to just shelve the compound. This is around the time their patent is gonna expire. The next we know of MDMA is uh, the Army Chemical Warfare Service, MK Ultra, looking for mind control drugs. And then Sasha Shulgin, who was an incredible chemist, he started looking for new drugs for psychotherapy and for personal growth and spirituality. And he resynthesized MDMA, experimented with it on himself, and felt that it had incredible potential for therapy. And so he gave it to Leo Zeff, who was the leader of the underground psychedelic psychotherapy community. From the middle 70s to the early 80s, roughly half a million doses of MDMA were used in therapeutic growth settings mostly by uh, people that Leo had trained. And it was found to be useful in a, in a wide variety of conditions, but it leaked out of that community, became sold as ecstasy. And this was at the time of Nancy Reagan and Just Say No and the rise of the drug war again. And so it was clear that it was doomed. So this was an incredible opportunity to gather support, to prepare for the defense of MDMA once the Drug Enforcement Administration finally decided to move against it. Um, it was in Dallas at the Stark Club where ecstasy really became popular. Uh, MDMA became popular as ecstasy in a, a dance club setting. Um, George Bush, all sorts of people uh, participated here. And this is what attracted the attention of the DEA. So in the summer of 84, DEA moved to put MDMA in Schedule One. They only knew about it as a party drug. They didn't know about it as a therapy drug. And so in 1987, when I graduated college, 
um, I couldn't get into a clinical psych PhD program. And so I, I decided, I don't know what I'm going to do now with my life. I smoked some pot and I thought I'll think about it while I'm high. And I realized I had a pattern, which is I want too much too soon. I want to do the polit I want to do the science, but the politics is in the way, so I need to pivot and study the politics. So in '86, I started MAPS as a nonprofit. MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. MDMA is the most gentle of all the psychedelics. That's why I felt it would be the first one to make it through the system. For the first six years, the FDA rejected five different protocols from Harvard Medical School, UC San Francisco, elsewhere, and it was just, we're just starting to emerge from this uh, period of uh, multiple decades of total repression of psychedelic research. So in 1992, Charlie Grobe and I obtained approval from the FDA for the first phase one dose response safety study for MDMA in humans. So that was major, major breakthrough. And I started working with uh, PTSD with uh, Dr. Michael Midhofer. And also, we started first off in Spain to try to do research here. Um, we were having trouble getting permission in the U.S. for an actual patient study. Uh, this study in Spain was the first MDMA PTSD research ever. And the tragedy was that it got a lot of media, but that alerted the Madrid Anti-Drug Authority, and they shut the study down for political reasons. So then we went back uh, to our efforts in the U.S., and we got FDA approval, but we couldn't get institutional review boards to permit us to do a study in the U.S. And a bunch of these had re rejected the protocol. So I said, let me just try one more time. And <clears throat> I noticed that one of these private companies uh, that reviews IRBs was called Copernicus. And I felt if anybody is sympathetic to uh, political religious pressure on science, it would be the Copernicus group. And lo and behold, they ended up approving the study. We ended up doing a series of phase two pilot studies in the United States, in Israel, in Canada, and in Switzerland. We did a study in uh, military veterans, firefighters, and police officers that we published in The Lancet. But these studies were all done from basically 16 years, from 2000 to 2016. So we gathered all of this phase two data. And at this point, now that we're starting to show benefits, uh, neuroscientists started getting interested. And this was something that I could have uh, very impressed from Stanford, Boris Heifetz and Rob Malenka. The world's populations need more compassion and empathy for one another. The study of MDMA provides one small but potentially important step towards reaching that goal. So this is a call to action for the world neuroscientists to study MDMA, not just for therapeutic purposes, but for compassion and empathy. So it gets back to kind of the political reasons that got me into psychedelics in the first place. And what had also been known is that if you have PTSD, um, it changes your brain. You have hyperactive amygdala where you process fear. You have reduced activity in the prefrontal cortex, so you're not thinking as logically. And hippocampus, where we store memories into long-term storage, activity is reduced. So this is kind of the brain changes that you get from PTSD. MDMA changes your brain also, but in the opposite way. So it reduces activity in the amygdala. So things that were fearful before are not so fearful. People talk about uh, self-love, self-acceptance, looking able, better able to look at difficult things. MDMA increases activity in the prefrontal cortex, which um, increases your logical thinking, triggers that might remind somebody of a trauma, a noise, that instantaneously they go into a fear-based reaction. Now they can have a moment to think about it, separate it out, think more logically. And MDMA increases activity between the amygdala and the hippocampus to facilitate the storage of these traumatic memories into long term so that they're not always about to happen in people's perceptions. So PTSD changes your brain. MDMA changes it in the opposite way. Researchers also found and published a paper in 2019 in Nature to show that MDMA stimulates oxytocin, the hormone of love, nursing mothers, connection. And that that opens up this critical learning period, but also it promotes new neural connections. So you are actually rewiring your brain in pro-social ways. And that can explain why just a few experiences, sometimes just one, can have long-lasting therapeutic benefits. So after 30 years of MAPS, from 1986 to 2016, after we had all of our phase two data, we went to the FDA for an end of phase two meeting, where you present your data and say, can we go to phase three? which is the final stage of research you need to prove safety and efficacy. 
And we presented this data. We said that in the control group, which is therapy without active MDMA, we had uh, chronic severe treatment resistant people and 23% of them at the two month after the last experimental session no longer had PTSD. So this is really tremendous from just from psychotherapy basically by itself. And this is comparable with other psychotherapy. So this showed that our control group and our therapy component was actually a good control because we were trying hard and people were getting somewhat better from that treatment. But when you add MDMA to the therapy, you get up to 56%, more than twice as much. And so this was really remarkable finding. But we also did a long-term follow-up one year later. And what we showed is that people keep getting better. The two-thirds no longer have PTSD. And of the one-third that still do have PTSD, most of them had clinically significant reduction of PTSD symptoms. And if we could have given them one or two more MDMA sessions, maybe they would also no longer have PTSD. But what this showed is that the experience that people go through is durable and that people learn to process trauma. They keep getting better on their own. So this is fundamentally different than normal treatments for PTSD from big pharma where you get a drug and it's supposed to correct a biochemical deficit and you take the drug every day for months or years or decades. We're just trying to do get to the root of the problem. We're not talking about addressing symptoms. We're addressing root causes, and we're trying to do it in a deep, intensive psychotherapeutic process to make people free of drugs. We're not trying to make them keep using MDMA. So just to give you a sense of the therapy, this is a, a roughly two-minute video of one of the veterans that was in our study. He uh, Two tours in Iraq, and his problem was rage that uh, when he came back, he would, um, he was, first off, he couldn't work. He was traumatized. He had a very difficult time, but, but he also would blow up at his, at his wife and throw things, never hit her or hurt her directly, but uh, rage was what he was dealing with. And so um, here is two minutes of his therapy session. I never realized how much I, I thought I was being the peaceful person, but I didn't realize how much I was punishing that, that, that aspect of me. Mm. Mm. I think I was just, I think maybe in Iraq I saw what it was capable of. And I think I was too afraid to, mm. you know, and a part of me just feels like so bad that I, I did that to him. Mm. I mean, I know it's me, but I just mm -hmm. describe yeah. it wise. Why are you? Um, yeah. yeah. But I just, Mm. That was really amazing, and I—I I don't know. I just got this amazing sense of just, I guess, wisdom. I really don't know. Mm. Mm. Sounds a lot like wisdom to me. Yeah, it, was, it was really amazing, and you know, I try and think of that really rageful aspect of me, like I can't even. I know it's there, but it just doesn't. It, I really feel like so much more at peace with like mm -hmm. everything. Great. Even if I try and think about Iraq and everything, like I somehow feel like really peaceful about the fact that that's my journey and that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Part of me think I mean I mean I know this is um, part of the um, you know part of the drug, but when I try and think, you know, am I gonna be able to hold on to this um this understanding and this um somewhat of wisdom, this knowledge that I have now. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, just ask myself that question. I feel like it's so profound that I don't think I could really forget it. So that was um, over 12 years ago. He did not forget it. And he no longer has PTSD. And he hasn't taken MDMA since the study. There's a certain courage that it takes for people to confront their traumas. And if they're not willing to do that, the MDMA helps them to do that, but it can't do the work for them. So we feel like we're more like uh, midwives than anything else and that people have to do the work themselves. So 
we have found there, there's a great video, a documentary called Trip of Compassion. And it's about three of our Israeli PTSD patients and their therapy. Now they were all successes, but but some of the times you can see that it's nothing like the video that I showed. They're shaking, they're they're sweating, they're they're terrified, they're they're hiding under their pillows and their their blankets. That that it's it's very very difficult for some people to 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 work through to process this. And a lot of times it's somaticized, so that if you can't um, sort of consciously make it, things come to people in their pains in their body or or tensions like that. Um, and so we've had several people um, who had MDMA drop out of our study because they didn't want to work with the powerful emotions that were coming up. And so I think for those people that it doesn't work for, they I would recommend something more gradual, like more um, psychotherapy over a prolonged period of time. And then maybe they would then be ready. So I think that um, it's about the willingness of people to really engage with the pain. And the MDMA helps them, but it doesn't do all the work. People have to be willing. And if they're not, then they won't get better. So the lessons that we learned in phase two, though, is that we can enroll people in our studies regardless of the cause of PTSD. The SSRI, Zoloft and Paxil, that are approved by the FDA for PTSD tend to work better in um, women than in men and completely failed in combat-related PTSD. But we can enroll people with PTSD from any cause. We found that low doses of MDMA do enhance the blinding, but they have an anti-therapeutic effect. That they, they make people more uncomfortable. They, they don't reduce the fear, but they activate them. So low dose wasn't such a good placebo control. We discovered that it's safe in clinical settings and that we had a medium to large effect size, that we were getting really good results. So in, uh, after this end of phase two meeting, we went through this long process of negotiating with FDA, what's called special protocol assessment to design phase three. So we came to agreement, we have an agreement letter, and that means FDA is legally bound to approve MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD if our studies get statistically significant evidence of efficacy and no new safety problems arise. Um, PTSD is, is a terrible situation. Six to 10% of all people develop PTSD in their lifetime. 18 or so more percent of Iraq war veterans develop PTSD. It's higher in conflict zones. And only 40 to 60% of patients respond adequately to available treatments. There's over a million veterans. This is September 2018. Over a million veterans are disabled with PTSD and are receiving disability payments from the VA for PTSD. It's the third most prevalent service-connected disability after ringing in the ears and hearing loss. The VA spends about 15 to 20 billion per year in these disability payments, mostly for young people. It's going to go on for decades. And they spent in 2017, $7 billion on drugs for PTSD. Mostly these are SSRIs. This is a, a chart sort of effect sizes, of how strong is the therapeutic effect. The FDA requires you to have two phase three studies that are statistically significant. And so Paxil had um, three studies. One of them failed. Um, but they have small to medium effect sizes, whereas in our phase two data, we had a large effect size. So on the basis of this, though, FDA said MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is a breakthrough treatment. It's the most important designation for the most promising drugs, and it gets you more meetings with FDA, shorter timelines. In a sense, we're almost partnering with FDA now to see if this research will actually work. Our treatment is three and a half months, and there are three MDMA sessions, eight hours long with a male-female co-therapy team, and people spend the night in the treatment center most of the time. And then there's 12 90-minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions with three before the first MDMA session, or, or this would be the placebo session, the therapy without MDMA, and then three of these sessions for integration after each MDMA session. So you can see from this that it's really therapy that is enhanced by the MDMA. And we have a two-person team. We, we prefer male-female team. Doesn't always have to be that way, but um, we're really trying to optimize patient outcomes. We've got phase three site locations, as I said before, 15 of them, two in Israel, two in Canada, and 11 throughout the United States. We've also negotiated with the European Medicines Agency for a series of meetings after we got the special protocol assessment with the FDA and breakthrough therapy from FDA. Then we went to Europe and we obtained approval in uh, June 12, 2018 
from the European Medicines Agency Scientific Advice Working Party to move forward to phase three in Europe as well. So we're a couple of years behind in Europe than we are in the US. We've got sites picked out in about uh, seven countries, 10 locations. So we, we think we're on track to succeed in this first of two phase three studies. If this drug is approved, the FDA will have special regulations on how it's to be regulated post-approval. And it's called risk evaluation and mitigation strategies. So it's not the drug, it's the therapy. So the only people that can prescribe this and treat patients are people that have been trained in the therapeutic approach. And it's only administered in clinics under direct supervision. It's never a take-home drug. There's going to be a centralized pharmacy that ships to the prescribers, not to the patients, and there will be certain uh, safety criteria. The things that are under the dotted line are things that we may or may not have to do. The FDA might want to impose a lifetime limit of the number of times people can get MDMA for PTSD, and they might want a patient registry. But the main aspects of this are to say it's fundamentally different than medical marijuana, which is a drug you take at home and do yourself. This is going to be administered only under direct supervision. We have a therapeutic method that's standardized based on a lot of the early work with LSD. Uh, the basic belief is that um, there's an inner healing intelligence. We support the emergence of what's happening. We don't try to steer people to certain things. We have a training program that trains therapists. And so we've been running training programs for uh, the last five and a half years. I'm uh, just going to run through them very quickly. Just you can get a sense of the, the scale of the number of people that we've trained all over the world. Um, this was in the Netherlands, in Israel, um, Asheville, North Carolina. This we're getting up to the present, Colorado. Uh, we did a training for therapists of color. Um, and we did another one in Asheville. We also evaluate and supervise them as they work with one PTSD patient. Everything's videotaped and our team watches the videotapes. And then we have a, you know, a week-long in-person training. So it's, it's rather rigorous, but we think it's optional. We don't want to require people to have to do the MDMA. We think that any therapist who's working with patients would be better able to work with MDMA if they knew what it was themselves. You wouldn't go to a meditation teacher that med never meditated or a yoga teacher that didn't do yoga, but we don't think we should require it. And we think the patients should be able to know the difference. So this is just a fun thing we made up a long time ago. There'll be a diploma that we give to people if they've been through successfully through our training program. And then we'll add these if they've, uh, the rainbows, if they've taken the MDMA. Um, to show again, further mainstreaming, this is a police psychotherapist, uh, Sarko Gregarian, who um, lives not far from me here in Boston. And he's going through our training program to learn how to give MDMA therapy to other police officers with trauma. So I've always felt that the police are the predator and I'm the prey. Now I have a lot more sympathy for the police. I understand their job is very, very difficult and that they need a lot of help and therapy. And so it's just one of the proudest things for me is working with uh, Sarko to try to train him to help other police officers. And we think he's only the first of many. Right now, what's going on is that MAPS is a nonprofit pharmaceutical company set up as a nonprofit research and educational organization. And that was started in 1986 uh, by myself. And in December 2014, we created the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. And that's the vehicle that we're using to do the pharmaceutical drug development. And that's the vehicle that we'll use to market MDMA by prescription, assuming that we do get FDA approval. And so this sort of virtuous circle is people donate to MAPS, get a tax deduction. MAPS invests in the Public Benefit Corp. The Public Benefit Corp is a for-profit. It will conduct the research, and then eventually market MDMA, and whatever profits are made go back to the nonprofit for the mission of the nonprofit, and we'll reinvest them in other research. Um, just to give you a sense, we're now about 80 people. The MAPS team has a bunch of functions, which are mainly um, running the whole operation, fundraising, communications, media, education, events, operations. We do psychedelic harm reduction, and we have a small policy and advocacy team as well. Then the clinical research team is led by um, a group of women who work together at Novartis Pharmaceutical Company, mostly in vaccines, and they happen to like psychedelics a lot more than they like vaccines. And so they started 
building out our pharmaceutical arm. And so now it's about 55, 60 people in the clinical research team. We've set up the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, which is for profit, because what we realized is that selling MDMA for a profit is taxable. We can't do that inside the nonprofit. So we have the for profit that will make some money from selling MDMA. That That's a story now that we can tell our donors that we're not going to be constantly asking you for money because you're helping us develop an income stream from the sale of MDMA. But the for-profit branch, the MAP Public Benefit Corporation, is 100% owned by the nonprofit. So now that it, we've gotten so far along and it looks like we're going to succeed and it looks like there's an enormous number of people that need this treatment, we've been inundated by investors who are saying, we'll you know, fork over dollars to you. We just want a cut of the profits. And so we're telling them no. And what we're saying is that we're trying, and this is what we're saying to donors, is that we're trying to do two things. The first thing is to pave the way for making MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD into a medicine to be the first in class psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. But the other thing we're trying to do is build a more sustainable nonprofit that will act as a, as a, a good example in the field to put the for-profit people in check. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about moving into the future. This is a, a chart for about uh, 50 years of the American voters' attitudes towards the legalization of marijuana. And you can see now it's well over two thirds. But there was a major plateau from around uh, the middle 70s to the middle 90s. That was the rise of the parents' movements, the anti-drug movement in the late 70s. And then in 1996, they started moving up. And that coincided with California and Arizona in 1996 being the first medical marijuana states. And then as more medical marijuana states came on, more people knew medical marijuana patients and saw that it was, uh, again, a drug that was demonized, that wasn't as bad as people had said. And that caused them to question everything. And that caused them to start thinking not just about medical marijuana, but about legalization. So I think that same process is going to happen with psychedelics, that legalization follows medicalization. We've now got um, in Denver was the first one to make mushrooms the lowest enforcement priority. Um, Oakland has expanded that. To, uh, they call it decriminalized nature to plant psychedelics. And then in Oregon, on the ballot in November, it's going to be the Oregon Psilocybin Initiative to provide different kind of structures for people to get psilocybin experiences. But the thing that's innovative there is, first off, on a state level, but also it's not just for patients. It's for personal growth. So once MDMA becomes a medicine, we think in 2022, there's going to be all sorts of expansions of this thousands of clinics and um, decrim, and we think we'll reach licensed legalization in 2035. Uh, this is just my, my personal guess. So I think that when I say that 2035 is going to be the uh, transition to licensed legalization, I think we're going to need a decade or more of these psychedelic clinics to have tens and thousands, 100,000 or so people successfully treated with psychedelics to have the, the ripple effect in culture to change people's attitudes towards legalization. And so I think we need to move out of this kind of uh, psychedelic counterculture. We need to reach out to the people that are suffering wherever they're suffering and try to help spiritualize them, try to help them sort of get uh, back on their life. And I think that that's one of the more important things we can do. So there may be ads like this, ask your doctor. If it, we, we're probably not gonna create ads like this, but there could be, um, there'll be, uh, this is in uh, San Francisco, California Institute for Medical Studies. This is, is not a real ad, but they do teach people to prepare for careers in psychedelic psychotherapy. The reason that I use them is people have a hard time imagining psychedelics being medicines. Uh, you know, So part of the way to tell the story is to show images of oh, this is the way it could be. And so these um, ads for marketing drugs, which I think are abomination, actually. I mean, America is one of the few countries that really permits direct-to-consumer ads. It, we should never have those, but we figured if we made some of them, it would be a good uh, teaching tool. And so I, I think the, the idea of the psychedelic clinics, the images of the psychedelic clinics, it, it's a way to kind of help people grasp something that they don't have any examples for in their life. And so by creating these kind of images, it's, uh, it's a communications tool. So psychedelics have been used for thousands of years in the Eleusinian mysteries. And I think that they have been used because they 
permit a certain kind of escape from our ego bound focus. You know, our, our ego is helping us to survive. It's, it's, um, you know, we, we have Abraham Maslow who's talked about the uh, need hierarchy. And so there's, um, various needs that we have and we keep focused on that and and we always have a sense of who we are both for protection and for advancement in the world and then we get stuck in certain patterns of thought and psychedelics uh, relax those patterns and they provide this um i'd say a, a good example a metaphor for example is the uh, copernican revolution so everybody thought that the earth was the center of the universe and everything revolved around that and then we found that no, the earth is just revolving around uh, the sun. And, and so I think it's like that with the ego. We think the world is revolving around us and the psychedelics help us have this experience. No, we're just a small a bit in a larger system. And um, what, what Stan Groff has talked about, I thought it was a beautiful way he said it, is that psychedelics help the ego become transparent to the transcendent. The ego doesn't go away. The ego doesn't die. We need to be recognizing that we're bound by birth and death. We have to do things to survive. We need that ego, but it gets um, enlarged, you could say, and we lose track of the bigger picture. And that's where people get depression and meaninglessness. And so psychedelics have been something that gives people a sense of our participation in the larger cycles of death and birth. And they have also been used um, I would say in a, in therapeutic ways to break people out of patterns. But I think that the reason psychedelic is the word that I've chosen, and I think a lot of people have centered on, is it means mind manifesting. So I went started with my own uh, interest um, roughly 50 years ago. So projecting uh, 50 years from now, we'll have a psychedelic utopia. Uh, and Aldous Huxley wrote this book, Island. It was the last book that he wrote in his life, and it was about um, this uh, vision of an Eastern state governed by reason and love. But at the um, end of the book is that this island is destroyed by the um, oil industry. They come in and they um, mine the island. And the lesson from that is that there are no private utopias. We are in a globalization world. Nobody can escape the COVID virus. Nobody can escape um, global warming, nuclear war. We're, there's no private utopias anymore. We need to make a psychedelic utopia and we need to make the island the entire world this uh, and so i think we'll get there by 2070 and that is my um, presentation and that's the the long now back to 2000 uh, or so 1600 bc and now to 2070 so thank thank you all very much Thank you so much, Rick. Um, that was really fantastic, um, and I hope you enjoyed watching uh, this first edit of your of your talk. Um, yeah, you made it so much better than my talk. <laughs> was great. No, you put it, you gave it you gave us all the great material, so we we tried to do with it what we could. Uh, so I'm I'm glad glad to hear that you liked it. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in from the audience, um, which I'm going to start with here, um, as well as uh, invite Stuart Brand and Kevin Kelly potentially in for a couple questions. But um, one of the first ones from James Welcher, uh, listening on our, our or watching on our YouTube feed, is that you you define MDMA as a psychedelic, and and it may not really occur to people that it's a psychedelic um, and that may not be so broadly defined as such, uh, and that maybe we talk a little bit more about the larger psychedelic space and why you have focused on MDMA. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, one thing when you kind of run a nonprofit, um, you want to have um, maximum um, capacity to do anything that you think is useful. So we define psychedelic in the broadest possible way. So psychedelic could even mean um, hyperventilation, um, which Stan Groff has talked about. It doesn't require a drug. Um, marijuana can be a psychedelic, um, which is a drug though. Meditation can be psychedelic to some extent. So let me just say that the classic psychedelics like LSD, like mescaline, like um, ayahuasca, like psilocybin from mushrooms, they do act fundamentally differently than MDMA in the sense that they are more about uh, dissolving the ego and having this emergence of this um, different sort of consciousness, the kind of... Um, foreground background shift that I talked about where the ego shifts from the foreground to the background. 
there's a, a certain letting go in a way. Often people get scared. Sometimes they confuse uh, this ego dissolution with physical death. And sometimes people, this timelessness that happens under um, psychedelics, people start thinking they'll be trapped in these spaces forever. Or the flip side is it's a beautiful thing. They're in this timeless, beautiful space. So MDMA, uh, to use some more celestial metaphors, again, what I feel like is that um, MDMA is, is more about um, seeing um, like this transparent to the transcendent, that, that you can see um, this b bigger picture. But the, the classic psychedelics are about um, really moving you into that bigger picture. And so I, I think that we've found that, the, for example, with PTSD, the very first work that was ever done with psychedelic for PTSD was done by LSD, by Dr. Bastians, who was a Dutch psychiatrist. And he did work shortly after World War II in what he called um, concentration camp syndrome. And so in that particular use, the, psych the LSD really did help bring to the surface buried memories, but it didn't really reduce the fear the way that MDMA does. And so it can be helpful, but it's also more challenging in certain ways. Um, the other part of it is a, uh, an important distinction is that in an eight hour session, which we have our therapy sessions are eight hours with MDMA, more or less half the time people's eyes are closed. They have um, headphones on, they're listening to music, they're having an interior experience. And then the other half of the time, without any kind of script or order, when they feel it, they come out and they start talking with the therapist. However, with the classic psychedelics, it's more like 90% of the time they're having an internal experience and only 10% of the time they're really engaged in dialogue with the therapist. So with the classic psychedelics, a lot of the therapy, what we think of as therapy, takes place as preparation and integration. And during the MDMA therapy session, a lot more of the therapy takes place during the session itself. And um, I know that you mentioned this in other conversations and in parts of the talk that we might have edited, but uh, that you do this with two people. And I know that one of the people, one of the therapists yeah. was off screen in the, the video that we saw. Um, can you say a little bit more about why two people and what those two, what the backgrounds of those two people? I think uh, we've had several questions yeah. uh, here from people around this is like, so what type of therapist uh, could, um, can be involved in this? Okay, so the, the first principle to say is that our, our a whole approach has been optimize patient outcomes. It's a controversial drug. It, you know, we're trying to bring something new that's never been done before. And so that was it. What do we do to get the best possible outcomes? And so that led to the two therapist model instead of the one therapist model. So what we also know is that a lot of the times that people have trauma, have pe people recover, they're resilient like a lot of the people are traumatized right now by COVID, will be recovering. Those people that tend to develop PTSD, and it's not true for everybody, but those people that uh, get PTSD tended to have a series of traumas and often have difficult attachments um, in childhood. So the, the, the two-person model is uh, often, in a sense, um, not only, but often male-female model. It's like recreating a supportive uh, parental environment that oftentimes people didn't have as they were growing up. It's also the case that you get two different perspectives. Some people, for example, a woman who's been sexually abused and has PTSD would be less comfortable if it's just a male therapist. If there's a female in the room, it helps. Sometimes even um, soldiers even sometimes prefer sometimes to have, speak to a woman. Some of the time they'll speak to the man. Um, and so we recognize though, the, oh, well, also it's an eight hour session. Somebody has to go to the bathroom. Somebody has to get something to eat. We want always somebody in the room if somebody had abandonment issues and then they come out of their uh, experience and there's nobody there, that would be you know, mildly problematic until somebody comes back in. So the two person model is not twice as good as the one person model. It's, it's better we think, but it's not twice as good. So the big issue then is going to be economics. How do we do it? And so that's going to get to the credential issues. So what happened during our special protocol assessment process, which was during 2018, where we negotiated with FDA the, the design of phase three, is we got them to accept, and they, they accepted it, that the lead person, the lead facilitator is a master's level therapist, has to be licensed as a therapist. But the second person 
doesn't have to have a license, could be a student working to get a license. Um, after that, we negotiated it. Then along comes two different companies, Compass for for-profit for psilocybin, USONA for nonprofit for psilocybin. And then FDA imposed new requirements on them, which is that the lead person had to be an MD or a PhD, which we feel makes no sense. So where we want to end up is that the lead person is a licensed therapist and the second person doesn't need to be a license at all. It could be a massage therapist. It could be a music therapist. It could be somebody who just has a lot of their own personal experience, or it could be a student, or it could be another licensed therapist. I mean, eventually we also want to explore group therapy for economic reasons as well. But I think this is going to be a part of our critical negotiations with FDA about what are the actual credentials that are required. And so the FDA has never regulated psychotherapy. They, they only regulate drugs. And this is the first time that they've got a drug psychotherapy combination. And they don't really know what they're doing. And so they're trying to be careful and trying to do what they think is more rigorous. So, oh, MD, PhD, you know, that's more advanced degrees. They must be better than a master's level therapist. But MDs, don't get trained to do therapy hardly at all. And even if you're a psychiatrist, a lot of them are psychopharmacologists more than they're therapists. PhDs are often even in clinical psych are researchers as well as therapists. So it doesn't, so we've had to actually start what's called a formal dispute resolution process with FDA. It's going to probably cost us well over a hundred thousand dollars in legal fees and, and work to argue this out. And we've got, um, 22 letters from various experts in the field of why MD PhD doesn't make sense, why the lead person should be a um, just a licensed therapist. So I think it's really important. I would like to keep the two person model, but it's going to depend on these negotiations with FDA. Let's assume we lose it. Then I think that the one person um, will need to be a licensed therapist. Gotcha. Um, thank you. And I'm going to invite Kevin Kelly, one of our Founders here at Long Now in for a question shortly. Um, he's been sorting the questions from our audience, and a lot have been coming in. So thank you for that. Um, and I just wanted to ask one other question. Um, you've mentioned memory several times in formation of long-term memories, um, and I don't think we normally associate uh, good memory uh, creation with uh, drugs like. Um, MDMA, but you said it counteracts something that's happening in PTSD. So if I just wanted to quickly, if you could just talk about how, 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 how these people are getting long-term memories uh, from a, the therapy sessions, and then we'll have Kevin join us. Yeah. Well, one, one of the amazing things that we find for people is that MDMA enhances their memory for the trauma. And so certain aspects of the traumatic memory are so painful. People have submerged them so much that they don't remember a lot of what happened during the trauma. And so by reducing the fear and the pain of those memories, people are able to remember more of the trauma. So in a way they're bringing to the surface these memories and they're permitting what's called fear extinction and memory reconsolidation. And so what um, fear extinction is, is you get over this patterned um, fear-based reaction because the MDMA, the drug helps you to do that. And then you can process the emotions and memory reconsolidation, what that means is that we, we used to think that memory was like um, taking a book off the shelf. You, you have the memory, you, you read the book, you put it back. Actually, you take the book from uh, multiple different places. It's sort of um, assembled from different parts of your brain. You remember it, and then you reconsolidate, and you have to reprint the book. And this kind of explains how people's memories are changed over time. But what right. we're doing is we are swapping out. So we're enhancing the memory for the, the episode. Episodic memory is enhanced. But through this fear extinction process and through temporally people being able to put the trauma in the past and not like it's always about to happen, doesn't always come to them in their nightmares, they're able to replace the emotion that's attached to the episodic memory. So the emotion is one of more peacefulness, acceptance, and it's in the past. And so that's how MDMA really can change how people respond to their memories, enhancing, and then also uh, swapping out different emotions that are attached to that memory. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna invite in Kevin. Um, we're also getting some uh, mic noise from your caller there. If you, yeah. if you can yeah. isolate the mic from your caller, that'll be awesome. Yeah. All right, yeah. welcome Kevin. Hi, so um, we have a couple questions about the general, uh, um, 
long-term destiny or direction of psychedelics and Leon Lin asks, what are the trade-offs in extending psychedelic use more broadly? And I would sort of maybe add, um, in the long term, do you see a role for psychedelics in society without the need for a therapeutic or medical setting? And then mm -hmm. in your license leg uh, le legalization, what is the license? I mean, what does ah, that mean? Yeah. Okay, so first off, let me say that I think that um, when we think about the Bill of Rights and we think about the freedom of uh, speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom of assembly, um, the freedom of the press, a, a lot of these things are about the freedom of thought and the freedom of ideas. So I think it's a fundamental violation of human rights to block people from using drugs. So I think that the drug war is never about stopping drug abuse. It's always got another political overlay, usually suppression of minorities. So all that means that I think that these drugs should be available to people outside of religion, outside of medicine for a whole range of purposes, and that we should approach it as recognizing that some of these people will get into trouble and we need harm reduction, we need pure drugs, we need honest drug education. And so I think that's going to be the the long-term strategy. So in a way, by being a nonprofit pharma, we are actually supporting ways for people to get the drug without having to get it from us. We would like them to be able to have these experiences. You could even say for preventative medicine, a lot of things from the FDA, like for example, all the people that are um, healthcare workers that are getting uh, traumatized from COVID, a lot of them don't have formal PTSD. You need chronic PTSD for six months to be in our study, but preventative it's not a disease yet, but they should have access to this kind of therapy. So the licensed legalization, what that means is, and this was actually proposed by Timothy Leary a long time ago, and he compared it to getting a driver's license. Mm -hmm. So the importance of it is that you can have it taken away. It's not that hard to get. You have to learn a certain number of things to do it. We're going to have thousands of psychedelic clinics and people will go to a psychedelic clinic and say, oh, I'm interested in LSD or I'm interested in MDMA. You go to a psychedelic clinic, you have the experience under supervision and you know what you're getting into, then you get a license and you can go out and buy it on your own. And then if you misbehave, you get punished for your misbehavior and then you have your license taken away for a certain period of time or you have to go back for an education class. So the, the best example there is alcohol is really not regulated the way I think it should be. Alcohol should also be licensed reg legalization because you have a bunch of people that are drunk drivers and lo and behold, they lose their driver's license for driving under the influence, but they don't lose their alcohol <laughs> ability and they go out and they get drunk and they go kill people when they don't have a license. So we should make it harder for people who misbehave with drugs to get more drugs. And that's the idea of the licensed legalization. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kevin. Yep. Um, and. Stuart Brand, uh, our founder and founder of this series, yeah. also has a couple questions, I believe. Welcome, yeah. Stuart. Hey, Hi, Rick. Hi, Stuart. You know, I first heard about MDMA being used in therapeutic mode um, by Dr. Rick, Richard Rockefeller, an old friend. And uh, I gathered he not only was being an evangelist for it, he started putting money into it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was he one of your funders? And, and how did the... He seemed to also get involved in the political permission that seemed to be required. How is all that playing out? Well, R Richard was actually, um, well, just to say, he was the chairman of the board of advisors of Doctors Without Borders. And he became aware of um, hundreds of thousands, millions of refugees in Kosovo and Serbia. And he thought, these are all traumatized people. What can we do? We don't have enough therapists and psychiatrists. He took an interest in MDMA and we got in touch. And for five years before he died in a plane crash, he was my main thought partner. Wow. And he came to me and he said, what is your biggest problem? And I said, it's the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense. They should be doing this research. They have the most expenditures. They have the most, uh, they're, they're causing the most trauma that they should be the most um, interested. And his cousin was Senator Jay Rockefeller, who was on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. Right. So they helped us a lot. Richard um, really made the, the, so right now, actually, we are waiting to hear from FDA um, any day now about a protocol that we've submitted inside the Bronx VA to do research with MDMA. We we're going to have to pay for it, but I've been trying for 30 years since 1990 to get permission to do research inside the VA, to educate the VA. And so to the extent that we will likely get permission, that's due to Richard and his wow. work. 
And so it's it's his legacy. And Richard donated a million dollars to us. Um, the rest of his family have also donated another million dollars um, after Richard oh, died. Uh, after that Richard died, we. Is that his son Clay or who? Well, it's his uh, sisters, uh, his brother, um, mm -hmm. and then after Richard uh, died, um, Clay and mm -hmm. Rebecca, his two children, they got together with some of their cousins and they gathered together half a million dollars to donate. So Richard was uh, tremendous, and I think also one of the most important things, uh, Dr. Bronner's is one of our big funders. They give us um, a million a year for five years. They've just extended it for five more years. And when Richard came out to give a speech at the Commonwealth Club with Larry Brilliant about um, MDMA, which was just a tremendous talk, um, David Bronner basically said, um, my family you know, thinks I'm a little bit out there, but you know, they generally like what I'm doing. But if you and Richard would come down and speak to my mother and speak to my brother, maybe we could increase the amount of donations that we make. And this is just a sweet story about Richard. So he was um, president of the Rockefeller Brothers uh, Foundation, and he was turning it over to a new, the next generation. And they were having a big ceremony to honor him. And he uh, postponed it in order to come down to be with me to speak to David Bronner and his family. So Richard was just absolutely instrumental in doing this. Um, we had meetings in the Pentagon that he arranged. He knew uh, the Secretary of the Navy. Um, he really did um, all that. And, and I think it was a challenge that was big enough for him. I think that's why when he said, what's your hardest problem? He knew nice. that he had a lot of capability to do a lot of things. So he wanted to pick the hardest one. And it, it, as it turned out, it was very hard. <laughs> and we're still... <laughs> I just love hearing that. That's just great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I was so... Well, we were also sad when Richard died, but he, he had... Um, basically gotten us to the point where the National Center for PTSD, which has run out of the VA, agreed finally to let us fund a study with one of their researchers blending MDMA with what's called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. But we had to do it, the researchers in their uh, private capacity, not part of the VA, that we had to pay for it and the subjects had to come from outside the VA. But that happened shortly before Richard died. So he knew that he had made this switch from uh, having no contact with the, the VA and then finally letting them uh, give us a little step forward. Wow. That's a great story. Richard was one of the first funders here at Long Now too. And we had him on stage with Larry Brilliant and uh, now um, one of our co-chairs of our board, Catherine Fulton, um, for the future of uh, philanthropy, which was just really great. So um, I think this is uh yeah, and, and I see. guess now that Richard is uh, long gone, I think it's uh, safe to say that he also was learning how to do therapy, and he was sitting for people, and he he was really taking this whole field to heart, and he, he was, uh, well, he's a doctor. He's a compassionate man, and he was learning to be a therapist with psychedelics. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a few more questions from, wow, we have a lot of questions here coming in from, <laughs> from the audience, as you might imagine, uh, it's a rich subject. Um, we have, uh, let's see, um, I think uh, Stephen Hubbard on the YouTube feed is asking more about the potential business models. I think ah, you covered okay. this a little bit. I mean, you're kind of involved in one oh. of these business, early business models um, with uh, MDMA or other psychedelics as therapy. Yeah. So, um, all right. So the MAPS Public Benefit Corp is about maximizing public benefit. So the first thing we've assumed is that the, the training program could be a business model as well, training therapists. But we've decided that we should run the training program at our cost because the real public benefit is healing people from PTSD. And the more therapists that are out there, um, the more healing there will be done. So we're not looking at the training program as a business model, but there will be, you know, thousands of people that will be training and that we could have made that into a business model. The next part is the um, actual sale of the MDMA. And so um, MDMA is off patent, you know, as I said, invented by Merck in 1912. And I saw a lot of struggles over intellectual property for a drug called Ibogaine. And it had a use patent for the treatment of opiate addiction. So I, I just thought that that was so destructive to the whole movement for Ibogaine. 
that I contacted their patent attorney and I asked them to develop an anti-patent strategy. So nobody could patent any of the uses of MDMA. Oh, nice. So, so there's no business model that way, uh, unless somebody comes up with some new use that we've you know, never heard of or that's never been written about. Okay, then there's a certain kind of patents you could have over process patents, over the production of the MDMA, the encapsulation, there's certain intellectual property that's never been done before. We're gonna make all that public. So our main business model is selling MDMA. And the way that that works is that in 1984, Ronald Reagan signed a law to provide incentives for developing drugs that are off patent. And those incentives are called data exclusivity. And so what that means is that if you're the first to make a drug into a medicine that's off patent, that automatically the FDA gives you five years where no one can use your data. You have exclusive use of your data. No one can use it to market a generic. And FDA is now also realizing that a lot of drugs that are approved in adults are marketed to kids without any information. So they are requiring us now, if we succeed in adults, to do studies in adolescents with PTSD. And you get an extra six months data exclusivity for that. And it blocks a generic manufacturer from applying until that five and a half years is over. It takes FDA at least six months. So it's going to be six years. In Europe, it's 10 years data exclusivity. So hmm. that's one model selling the MDMA. Then the other main business model is going to be the clinics. Where are these drugs actually going to be delivered? And as I said, they're only going to be delivered by trained therapists under direct supervision. So you could imagine um, networks of clinics. We're, we're actually looking at more and more of a model where we want these clinics to be locally owned, not like a franchise. Well, franchise can be locally owned, but we're not trying to maps have uh, you know thousand clinics. And the other thing to say about the clinics is that we're talking about psychedelic psychotherapy, not just MDMA. So the therapists all want to be cross trained. They want to know ketamine. They want to know MDMA. They want to know psilocybin. They're eventually going to want to know, you know, DMT, ayahuasca, ibogaine, whatever comes down through the FDA. So they're they're not going to be like a maps clinic. We we will have um, certain everybody that we train will be on a list, and they'll be able to um, access the drug and treat patients. But they can innovate, and they do whatever they want, um, and that's fine. That's you know the practice of medicine. However. For those people that want to continue to use our treatment manual, we will say they're MAP certified. And so you will know if you go to a clinic, these are people that are um, innovating. It could even be better than our model. But, you know, if you go to a MAP certified clinic, but it could also be a Compass certified clinic or a USONA certified clinic or so that people will be cross-trained. So I think the, the business models that we're still just starting to understand and explore are these network of clinics. Gotcha. And um, I think we had a few questions here. Um, so I think that follow up on that. I mean, one, for instance, a, a drug that's already being used in some cases, not necessarily therapeutic, but certainly um, maybe with therapy, therapy in mind is ketamine. Um, yeah. uh, can you say how that fits into this space? Yeah. Yeah. So um, ketamine yeah, I is... Think that the patenting and uh, yeah, yeah. the, the yeah. farm up side of this, I think is interesting. Yeah. yeah. So ketamine was the main battlefield anesthetic in Vietnam. So it's an old drug and it's really good because it doesn't interfere with your respiration so that you can be, um, you could self-administer it and you inject it. It doesn't have to go IV. You just inject it in a muscle too. So the main molecule ketamine is generic and it's just very inexpensive. So what a pharmaceutical company did, uh, anesthesiologists started to notice that as people were coming out of operations, those that had been depressed before, some of them were no longer so depressed. And that led to, so it was a serendipitous finding. A bunch of myself, loads of people that I know um, in the psychedelic community have explored ketamine as a psychedelic, but a lot of us completely missed the idea that it was an antidepressant because we weren't depressed. So we didn't have the before and after. But the National Institute of Mental Health started looking at this. And so a pharmaceutical company picked it up. But what they realized is, why are they going to do research with a generic drug? That How are they going to make their money back? So they took one of the isomers. Um, so a, a drug is called racemic. It's got sort of left hand and right hand. 
And these molecules are the same, but because they're mirror images, they fit in different places in the brain. And so the, the different isomers have different effects. So uh, Janssen and Johnson and Johnson worked on S-ketamine, which is one of the isomers, and they've made that into a medicine for depression. And this is, and they've got a patent on that because no one thought to make an isomer into a medicine for depression. And what is this they've the, the data exclusivity side, or is this its no, own patent no, because no, of the isomer? Yeah, it's it's, its own oh, patent. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, so, but this is, a, I think, a, a, a bad example of for profit pharma because maximizing profit, not patient outcomes. Because when you, they're treating S ketamine as if it's a strictly pharmacological treatment and that you don't need any support. And they sometimes have, uh, we, we had a fellow named Pine who was an early um, Bitcoin investor and he donated five and a quarter million dollars worth of Bitcoins to us. He gave away around um, $56 million worth of Bitcoins. This is uh, late 2017, early 2018, but he did, he was depressed and he had borderline personality disorder and he went for ketamine therapy. And he had this vision that the way to, for him to get out of his problems was to help other people, which is a very simple, brilliant insight. <laughs> and and he, he wanted to tell the therapists about this. And they said, we don't care what happened. It's all about this physiological thing. Forget about the story. You know? And when he learned about that, what we did was combining therapy with the drug, he said that's the model he wanted. But when you do combine therapy with S-ketamine, you get better results. It's the whole integration process that, that, that you need afterwards, but you'll end up needing fewer ketamine sessions. And that's not going to be so good for the pharmaceutical company. So they market this in a suboptimal way for patient outcomes, but in a way for them to try to make the most money. But what they've also done to kind of, um, well, what, what's happening now is a lot of the people who are prescribing ketamine or S-ketamine have realized why should they pay 500 bucks or whatever to this pharmaceutical company when they can buy generic ketamine for a dollar or two dollars. And the insurance companies, you know, sometimes you could work with them to cover some of the therapy. So what we see happening more and more is that therapists are working with the generic cheap ketamine rather than the S ketamine, and they're adding ther therapy to it. But still, oh, there's th there's an awful lot of people, anesthesiologists, a lot of times now, are using ketamine in um, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT suites. Hmm. So a lot of anesthesiologists who are not therapists are just finding a new income source to give ketamine, because anesthesiologists use ketamine for operations, and they just use these ECT suites and they just line them up and give them ketamine. And wow. the, the benefits tend to fade after time, uh, sometimes even uh, after a week or a few days. Uh, but some people do get enough sessions. They, they get over their uh, depression permanently. But I think it's an example of really profit maximization rather than um, optimizing for patient benefits. But ketamine <laughs> is a great drug for uh, depression and for, other, and for psychotherapy. And uh, Chris Chatham um, from one of our feeds asked about this too. I think you've mentioned it now with the with this, which is this. What about these fast follower um, kind of small changes to the molecule in order to create these patented situations? Do you think there's opportunities for that in MDMA or some psilocybin or any other ones? Well, not really. I don't think so. I mean, Sasha Shulgin, who um, you know, he tinkered with um, hundreds of drugs of the molecule of MDMA var variations. And he said, there's a, a movie, a documentary about him called Dirty Pictures. And in, in the documentary, what he says is of all the MDMA like drugs, he thinks MDMA was the most effective, but you, you could imagine people could take her with it. But one of the reasons why we're not interested in that is first off, we couldn't afford it because if you have a new molecule, you have to do enormous number of safety studies. With MDMA, because tens of millions of people have taken it, because governments all over the world have tried to demonize it and focused on the risks, there's over 5,000 papers in Medline. And we know an awful lot about it it's at around $450 million. So I think what we really need is new social contexts for legal access in therapy, in religion, in other ways. But you know, I, I think that there will be for-profit people will come along and if they can tinker with the molecules and make them better, all you know, all, all more power to them. 
we're, we're not against it, but we're just not trying to do it ourselves. And I think that it's unlikely that they're going to develop something better than psilocybin that's around for thousands of years or, you know, who knows? One of the things that people could be doing is trying to shorten the span of it. So yeah. let's say you can get um, like five MEO DMT, you know, that's like a 10 minute thing or DMT. If you smoke, it's a 10 minute thing. So we find that the eight hour session is actually really good. It's not a problem that it's that long. Right. It permits people to do an awful lot of work in still a relatively short amount of time. But you could imagine drugs that are manufactured and designed to be um, a half hour, and then you could do it. At, I don't know that you'd get better outcomes, but but right. you know, I never knew when I um, knew all about psychedelics from the seventies. When I learned about MDMA, I initially dismissed it, and then when I tried it, I was like, "Oh my god, this is really great! This is a new development." So, you know, yep. let, let's hope that they find new stuff that's great. Cool. Um, Shell Kappen from our feed um, is asking about the kind of the politis politicization of some of the federal agencies that you're working with and how they've hollowed out recently or um, is the, what yeah, is the current, where does the current climate fit into some of the work that you're doing? Is it cause fast tracking or slow tracking or what? Um, we, we have once, um, let me say this, that the, we, we do not currently experience feel that we're experiencing any political obstruction whatsoever. So for example, on May 1, the uh, disabled American veterans put out their bi-monthly magazine to 1.3 members of disabled American veterans. And the cover article was about MDMA PTSD. 1.3 million, I assume. 1.3. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. 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 1.3. Yeah. So we are, um, we have bipartisan support for what we're doing. Um, you know, Rebecca Mercer, who was one of the funders of Trump and Bannon and Cambridge Analytica is one of our funders. And her only limitation was this has to go to veterans. So we feel that we have bipartisan support. We have veterans with the with the conservative forces more are supportive of uh, first responders. We've treated uh, firefighters. We've treated um, police officers, multiple police officers, actually. Right. So the, the way that these other agencies have been hollowed out has been, um, I would say, the tragic systematic destruction of the State Department, the Department of Justice, um, attempts to overly politicize them. But the FDA is um, still more science over politics. And if, when it comes to the upper levels, if there are politics, I think the politics are on our side. So when we had our meeting um, for end of phase two meeting, uh, November 29th, 2016, um, one of the things that I um, started out with um, you know, and, and um, was saying that um, I was really glad to be at an agency where um, evidence-based was still an acceptable word. Nice. And so, so I think yeah. FDA, we, we can still count nothing on else. I, that. I learned that both Reagan and Bush were kind of instrumental in the early phases of this. I guess Reagan with the data <laughs> privacy and then Bush at the early parties, which was kind of an <laughs> yeah. amazing thing to understand. Um, I think we got to wrap up here and uh, this has been so great. Um, but I I wanted to ask, uh, there was a great article that came out in Forbes yesterday. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, if you could maybe mention that what's oh, being yes. announced there as well as um, just maybe touch back on the uh, these phase three trials that were, that. Uh, results that may be coming out and the future of maps and and your yeah. work. Okay, so uh, the article yesterday was what was called an interim analysis. The article in Forbes was about how when uh, we pre-negotiated with FDA that when we we have to do two 100 person studies for the first one, when we had 60% or 60 subjects had reached their primary outcome measure and we had all 100 enrolled then we could have a data monitoring committee that would look at the unblinded data and compare the actual data to the hypothetical data that we used to do our statistical power calculations. And the interim analysis data monitoring committee has three options to tell you. One is um, you're fine, that you don't need to add anybody. And we set it up ahead of time that we wanted to have a 90% or greater probability of obtaining statistical significance. The interim analysis could also tell you um, you need to add a bunch of people. For whatever reason, your results aren't quite as good as you thought. The FDA approves drugs on the basis of statistical significance, not effect size. So if the effect size is lower, we need to add a bunch of patients to still get this 
high probability of statistical significance, the FDA will still approve it. So that was the other thing the interim analysis could tell us how many people we needed to add to restore this 90% probability, or they could say, give it up. It's not working. It's futile. And so there's only one other drug that was approved by the FDA as a breakthrough therapy for PTSD. They had the interim analysis in February. It was a drug called Tanmaya by Tonics Pharmaceuticals. And their interim analysis um, told them that uh, the study had failed for futility and they'd spent well over $100 million. And so they had to uh, give it up. So they were a breakthrough drug in phase three and they still failed the interim analysis. So wow. we think we're doing fantastic. We're on track. And our, um, we've raised roughly um, eighty million dollars so far. We've got um, another um, thirty million that we're trying to raise. Uh, we, we've got about eleven million of it. We're just going to be announcing a. Um, we've got a five million dollar matching grant. If we can raise five million, we'll get another five million. Um, and so I think one of our challenges has been um, fundraising because we don't want uh, investors. We want to really be free once it's approved to market it to maximize social benefit, patient benefit. Um, so I think we anticipate starting up again um, in a couple months with the research. We hope by the end of 2021, we'll have um, all the data we need. And then by the end of 2022, we hope to have FDA approval for uh, prescription use. And can you say where people can find the Forbes article from yesterday? Yeah, well, um, if you go to the, well, just go to um, Forbes um, MDMA and, and Google it and you'll get it there. Or you go to the MAPS website where we have a, a section called MAPS in the media. So it's posted there. And it's something that's, uh, I, I thought it was a really excellent article about the, um, the results of the interim analysis. Great. Well, um, did you, and did you pass that uh, interim analysis now? Is that what's happened or that's what you're Well, well, well okay. So let, let me explain one thing. So the interim analysis takes place interim before you're done. So what we are told is we don't need to add any more people because of COVID-19, the FDA is contacting all of the people that are in the midst of clinical trials and oh, wow. offering them the opportunity to end the study early. So the more subjects you have in the study, the more likely you are to get statistical significance. So it's a bit of a risk to end the study sooner with right. fewer numbers of subjects. But what we proposed back to the FDA is that we would end the study with 90 subjects who would have their baseline and at least one of their primary, their measures after at least one experimental session. So our model is three experimental sessions one month apart and these 12 90 minute non-drug sessions so we can have we'll have some missing data because some people had started and then covid they were quarantined they didn't want to go for more treatment but we think that the fda will agree to this and we should have the data by the end of june and then we'll have the data lock and uh, statistical analysis before the end of august and then we'll know if this subject uh, this first of two phase three studies succeeded and so we're in a good situation negotiating with the FDA. We are in this formal dispute about the credentials. So we do have some disagreements with them. I the think credentials of the, uh, the people of the doing therapy. The therapy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Gotcha. Well, um, first of all, I just want to thank you so much. I was so excited to have had you tonight. And um, I'm really glad that we got to share this with our community. Um, we did send out a link to uh, our members. We're trying yet another experiment in our after event discussions. Um, and so please do check your email for that. Uh, and I know at least some of our staff and others are going to join. Uh, I know, Rick, you may have another obligation, but we'll yeah. see if we can get you for a little bit. Um, yeah. And I think. Um, I just want to thank you for the compassion um, and the science that you've brought to this uh, field that has really lacked that uh, in any formal sense. And and you and MAPS have done a fantastic job. So thank you so much. Yeah. And well, it started with uh, the Whole Earth Catalog and Earth catalog, re right? re reading great. about John Lilly. <laughs> so I mean, this is, I've been waiting for this for a long time. This is so nice to kind of uh, <laughs> participate with you in this way. Well, I'm so glad it worked out. Thank you so much. Yeah. Please hang out okay. with us and we'll see you in the studio okay. shortly.